Support comes from Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to sustainable and sound conservation of the state's forests, which support more than 41,000 Missouri jobs, resulting in a $10 billion industry. Choosewood.com. Welcome to St. Louis on the Air. I'm Sarah Fenske. Ten years ago, a trio of recent law school graduates formed a nonprofit law firm. Their names were Michael John Voss, Thomas Harvey, and John McCanner. They called it Arch City Defenders, and they had a novel idea. Connect the people who needed help, not just with legal representation, but with social services. That might mean substance abuse counseling. It might mean housing. Today, the attorneys at Arch City Defenders continue to assist the people they represent in ways that go beyond a typical law firm. But they also do much more, giving what remains a relatively small firm an outsized impact on the St. Louis region. They've handled more than 9,300 individual cases. In addition to representing low-income people who need help, they've taken on the system. They've sued various area municipalities over predatory policing, cash bail, excessive court fees, and debtor's prison. They've represented activists fighting City Hall, and they've forced real change. Joining me in studio to talk about the firm's work is co-founder Michael John Voss. Michael John, welcome to the show. Good morning. We're also joined by Arch City's executive director, Blake Strode. Blake, welcome to the show. Thank you for having us. For those of you listening, has the advocacy of Arch City Defenders made an impact in your life? How? You can give us a call at 314-382-8255. That's 382-TALK. Or you can send us a tweet at STL on air or email us at talk at stlpublicradio.org. So, Michael John, this firm that you started, it's had such a remarkable decade. Looking back on the 10 years of work that you've done, what do you think has been the firm's biggest achievement? Um, well, outside of just continuing to exist, uh, that's Being here. The, the, the most important thing, right, is been able to, to stick to it and continue the work. But I think in terms of our, our greatest achievement, I think um, what I'd have to say is looking back on it, it is really the, the lawsuit against Jennings. Uh, it kind of set the tone for the rest of the litigation that we've pursued. Um, Tell us about that. I know you've had a number of lawsuits against municipalities. Was Jennings the first? Jennings was one of the earlier ones. It was filed uh, six months after the murder of Mike Brown. Um, and we targeted Ferguson and Jennings and filed that litigation on the same day in February of t- 2015. Uh, Jennings uh, went to settlement. And uh, we got recovery for a class of roughly 2,000 people who spent roughly 8,000 days in Jennings Jail, uh, all because of their inability to pay off traffic tickets. Um, And they were held unconstitutionally in in horrible conditions. But we got a a settlement of $4.75 million for that class. That's a huge deal. Yes. And so everybody who had been under those conditions, they all ended up being represented by this lawsuit. Right. It was a class action. And it was a civil rights class action. And it it really set the the stage for future litigation in terms of what we uh, are seeking in terms of holding towns accountable uh, an authority accountable for, for their violations of constitutional rights. Do you think just the size of that verdict put all these small municipalities on major notice? Yeah, it did, <laughs> most definitely. Um, and, and subsequently, we've sued roughly another um, dozen, half dozen towns since then uh, for, for alleging the same practices, uh, which were rampant back in, in the day. And that, that was something that we noticed as an organization working in the municipal courts, which was uh, a court system that basically was running free from any sort of authority or supervision. And uh, these these municipal courts were functioning basically as revenue streams for towns in our region, and uh, the police departments in these towns were, were policing people for profit. And uh, we actually were just going through some of the data in some of the towns that we've, we've litigated against recently, and it's just astronomical back in 2014, for example, um, the number of outstanding tickets and warrants in these towns and the amount of revenue that was being generated in these, in these towns, mostly um, you know, impacting poor people and people of color in our region. And you're referring to that in the past tense. Is your sense, I mean, you guys have your pulse on the communities that are, are living in these areas. Uh, do you think that's largely changed or is largely going way too far? Uh, yeah, like I mean, I, I would say there has certainly been change, but the underlying dynamics are still the same. I mean, if you look across the region, we have seen a a tremendous decrease in municipal court revenues and warrants and tickets. Uh, but frankly, it's still far too high. So on the day that Michael Brown was killed, there were 700,000 outstanding warrants for arrest. 
in the St. Louis area. In the St. Louis area. It's just a ridiculous number. Now, today that's down to 250-ish thousand. So that's but quite a few less. Quite a few less. Still kind of a big number. Exactly. Still way, way, way too many. And so we still have the same underlying dynamics. We still have the same sort of over-policing in low-income communities, communities of color. We still have places that are relying on, on tickets for revenue. And so... The structural point that that I think MJ is pointing to, that when we started focusing on municipal courts, the the fix we always believed was a structural one. That's why we called for the consolidation of municipal courts. That's why we said that these weren't actually acting as courts, but rather as revenue generators. And that still is true in many places today, unfortunately. Now, Michael, John, back when you guys started um, poking around these municipal courts, it seems like at that point there wasn't attention being paid to this. Nobody realized what a systemic issue this was. Do you think if it hadn't been for Michael Brown's death that all the work you guys were doing on that front might have remained more under the radar? You know, I I think about that frequently, and and my answer to that is it it depends, obviously. Um, Obviously, the tragic death of Michael Brown uh, was a catalyst for uh, uh, action and activity of, of people protesting what they saw day in and day out in their lives, being over-policed, being um, targeted because of their, this, this, the color of their skin. And um, that sustained protest in the streets was was something that had been a long seething rage that had been silent, and it finally found an outlet there. Um, and if, you know, when it, we had been working on a white paper after a court-watching project in 2013, highlighting some of the abuses that we saw in the municipal court system. We focused on three towns that we just basically picked based on some of the data we were looking at. We looked at Florissant, we looked at we looked at Bell Ridge, and we looked at Ferguson. And so we had kind of, you know, when the news media came to St. Louis and started asking why here, why now, we had a part of the puzzle piece to that answer, to that, that puzzle, what, what was going on. Mm-hmm. And it was basically because, the, you know, the citizenry had been subjected to really abusive practices and uh, didn't trust local government anymore, and maybe never did. And that that was just part of that. And that was in the white paper. That was part of the catalyst, and, and you know, was cited heavily by many news sources, and by the Department of Justice when they came uh, and investigated Ferguson. And so that, that white paper preceded Michael Brown's death. Mm-hmm. The work on it had, but we happened to have it almost finalized on that day. And once we saw what was happening in the streets, once we ourselves came out to protest and heard what people were saying, we knew that we needed to, to release it. And so we did. OK. So that that report was already in the works, but you hadn't released it prior right. to that. Right. It sounds like the timing, honestly, just could not have been better as far as the work that you guys already had underway. Right. I mean, it's a combination of hard work because we had been around for five years at that point in time. Um, we had been able to sustain and grow the organization. And you know, what was originally just three guys volunteering their time had grown into a staff of roughly seven or eight at that point in time. And um, we were able to, to keep the doors open, the lights on. Uh, we are a nonprofit, so we don't charge our clients anything it hadn't. And we were able to, to get it to the point where we were doing the work day in and day out. Some of these 9,000 cases we're talking about, we, we had hundreds of clients we had represented at that point in time. <coughs> And it was just, um, it had gotten to the point where we we knew what we were seeing day in and day out in these courts needed to be uh, talked about, needed to be shown, uh, needed to be uh, uh, attacked strategically. It couldn't just be going, you know, going out one day every night to municipal court and banging your head on the door. Uh, Instead, you wanted to come and just knock it all down. And so we thought we need to do something more strategic, something that looks at the systemic problems. And that was the white paper. And at the same time, that white paper, as much as it really focused national attention on this issue, it also brought national attention to the firm. Mm -hmm. I feel like, Blake, you're almost an example of this. Um, You're a Harvard guy. (laughs) And yet you end up in this firm that was started by some St. Louis people almost as a, it wasn't even a full-time thing. It was at that point in 2014, but it it definitely, originally, originally was not. No, yeah. yeah, it was all part time. Mm-hmm. So uh, what made you how did you even hear about the work this organization yeah. was doing? Was this something that reached the the Ivy League and the halls of Harvard? Well, it did. I will say I'm, I'm first and foremost a St. Louis guy, but I had made my way to Harvard for law school. Um, and I was looking at opportunities for you know post-graduation and I was very undecided. Um, and the the 
Ferguson Uprising was very much an inflection point in my life as well. I began looking for opportunities in St. Louis, and I learned about this organization, Arch City Defenders, that was one of the only organizations really on the ground that had a deep understanding of that municipal legal system that was targeting people like Michael Brown. And I, you know, first became a fan of the work the organization was doing, and then I came to work with Arch City, uh, and of course I'm, I'm privileged to help lead the work today. But um, it did very much reach the the halls of the Ivy League and all over the country. It's, I think people were trying to better understand what was happening in Ferguson, what was happening in St. Louis, uh, and looking for people that really could provide some analysis. Going back to those humble beginnings for just a moment, um, Jackie Langham is Arch City's Director of Advocacy, and she came over after working as a staff attorney of Legal Services of Eastern Missouri. She was on our Politically Speaking podcast the other day with you, Blake, and she recalled seeing uh, the co-founder of the firm, Thomas Harvey, during Arch City's early days. Let's let's listen. I remember this this guy, Thomas Harvey, was always talking um, about his plan to make change, and I thought they had lost their minds with with what they were trying to accomplish and it was courageous. It you know everyone was betting against them. They didn't have the resources, they didn't have the funds. They didn't really care about what people thought of them. They just did what was right. And we are here today because John and Michael John and Thomas had the vision for helping people and a legal system that was built for the people and not for the system and the structures and to perpetuate that inequality. That's Jackie Langham, the director of advocacy. And I just loved hearing her say that because it sort of captures just what an uphill battle to get to the point that you're at. When you guys first founded this thing, I imagine that municipal courts and systemic reform maybe weren't so much on your mind. What was the original thinking there? Right. So um, from our experiences in law school, all three of us went to St. Louis University School of Law and um, following in the Jesuit tradition of of that school of service, we... uh, basically took some classes in public interest law and and, and did some projects basically uh, working on both the criminal side and the civil side of indigent legal representation. And we saw sort of the fact that the existing nonprofits, the existing entities that were supposed to serve the indigent population, one, were over, overburdened and overworked. The public defender system in the state of Missouri is the second to least funded public defender system in the nation. It's Mississippi and then us. Uh, and then you look at legal aid, and legal aid doesn't have the ability to hit the capacity that, that they need to in terms of clients. Many people are rejected. And so you also look at the fact that there was no communication between the civil and the criminal, the, the two organizations that are supposed to serve this population. And we, we thought there got to be a, a better way to do this. And I was at legal aid working in the housing division, actually, and Jackie was one of the attorneys I was working for. Um, and... Uh, Thomas was at the public defender's office, and he was basically triaging people out of getting services p- from a public defender. Hmm. And we, we looked around, and we thought, there's got to be a better way, and we came across an organization called the Bronx Defenders, and they practice what's called holistic representation. They pioneered this idea where you do both criminal and civil representation, and you connect your client to social services to bet- get better outcomes in their lives. And that model was what we wanted to replicate here. And we were in law school. We were studying for the bar. And we called the Bronx Defenders and actually got a hold of the woman that ran that organization, Robin mm-hmm. Steinberg. Uh, Thomas called her, and she she actually answers her own phone <laughs> and had a long conversation about holistic representation and how to do it. Um, and so we, we eventually got technical assistance from the Bronx Defenders through a grant to the Department of Justice back in 2011, 12. Um, but we wanted mo- to model that work here. Um, The thing that's evolved over time is adding the systemic litigation to it. Mm -hmm. The first five years was mostly direct services work, and it was doing civil and criminal representation in a lot of municipal courts where there are no public defenders. And we were doing that work, like I said, and we just saw these systemic problems. And we we realized that as lawyers, we have the ability to impact people's lives in ways that that others don't. And uh, it's a great power and responsibility. And so when you can do that, when you can keep families together, when you can separate them, when you can lock someone up or you can keep them free, that's an, an amazing power to have. And we needed to do more with our degrees than just individual representation. And so that's why we went into the civil rights arena. Blake, in terms of um, the current running of this office, mm-hmm. what percentage would you say is spent on sort of the systemic fight versus helping these individual people who just need help right now? Yeah, good question. I 
I would say it's somewhat evenly split. Uh, we, we always think about the direct services, the holistic direct services, as being at the center and the core of what we do. Mm -hmm. And what I really love about Arch City Defenders is I think it's always been infused with this understanding that people have these immediate material needs, real people, individual clients that need help in that moment. And if we're not doing something to attack the systems that are attacking them every day, that dynamic's never going to change. You really need both pieces. You really need both pieces, and you need the systemic advocacy to be informed by those direct client relationships, to be informed by the experiences that they're undergoing every day. And that's what we really try to model in our work at Arch City. So we've built out, we, we describe the work sometimes as, as falling into four buckets. We have direct services, impact litigation, policy and media advocacy, and what we call community collaborations. And that last category, community collaborations, that's the campaigns, the partnerships, the coalitions. Uh, and that part of our work has really grown tremendously in the past few years. And mm -hmm. uh, we really believe in, in moving collectively with other aligned people that, that want to see a, a more just St. Louis. Now, you guys have gone from these three part-time lawyers in the very beginning to a staff of 29, and yeah. 15 of them are lawyers. How big of a demand day-to-day -day is it trying to just keep enough funding to make this entire mechanism work? Yeah, no question. That's that's a big part. It's a big part of my role now. Um, we have a development team now that works hard on that every day. Um, it is a reality of nonprofit work that uh, a big part of it is fundraising. And so we receive individual donations, private grants. We get some state and federal funding. Um, but that sort of comes with the territory. Mm -hmm. yeah. it is a big part of it grants versus having to, to work with donors? Or it's it's really a mix? Actually, the largest part at this point is the, the private individual donations. And um, I would say, you know, 30% individual, maybe 25% foundations, private foundations. But the largest chunk now are those private funds. Okay. Yeah. So people have stepped up. That's yeah, yeah. absolutely. I like to characterize it. We're the Bernie Sanders of uh, nonprofit <laughs> civil rights work. People are chipping in $25 yeah, here, exactly. $25 no, there. Really? Yeah, yeah, monthly donations, Yeah. all that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Um, sorry if I could just – the – a huge part of the growth of Arch City Defenders has been because the people in this region have sort of thirsted for a different kind of advocacy and are really hungry to see change and appreciate the kind of agitational work that Arch City does. So to, to MJ's point, yeah, people are chipping in and helping us do what we do every day. So in terms of the work that these 15 lawyers are working on, I saw that one of your cases involved a client's 15-year battle with Ferguson's Municipal Court. 15 years over this? I mean, that's, I feel like a lot of lawyers at some point would have said, uh, let's just settle this thing. Right. I mean, that's a ton of hours. Right. So, yeah, I, I, that that case, I, I think maybe Blake can maybe speak to a little bit more. Well, I would first say it's not unusual that a lot of people have tickets dating back to you know, early 2000s that they're still getting called into court to see if they can pay down another 25 bucks on the 400 they owe or wow. whatever it is that's built up over time. So it's, it's of course, we haven't been around for 15 years. We haven't handled the case for 15 sure. years, but people do come to us, you know, and we have some clients that have been clients for six, seven, eight years and wow. have been wrestling with the same municipality over something that started as a traffic top as a traffic stop for that period of time. And so part of our work is to continue to show up with those clients, to continue to try to connect them with the resources they need, to never sort of let them simply become another cog in the wheel of the system that they're showing up to pay the piper once a month because we know that they'll never get out of that trap. At the same time, you know, you've got these these little cases that you're kind of chipping away at, and then there's these big grand vision things mm -hmm. that you were talking about. Let's talk about the Close the Workhouse campaign. I know that's been a big focus, and you guys lined up a lot of big names on this. You had, like, Ben and Jerry. Like, they're <laughs> all on board for this. But there seems to be just this commitment from the city to keeping it open. Um, how critical is this to the conversation in, about making St. Louis a place that, that is equitable and that where poor people can get a fair shake to getting this place closed? Yeah. You it, it, yeah, I mean, it's, it's extremely critical. I mean, the, the amount of money that we're spending uh, to keep an old, uh, decrepit building up and running to house people that are, again, presumed innocent under the law, it's mostly pretrial, uh, people that are just too poor to afford the ability to get released because they can't afford a cash bond. 
uh, the, the fact that we're spending millions and millions of dollars on that facility, which could be and should be spent in the community, because we know that that incarceration and and prosecution doesn't end the crime. It doesn't it doesn't resolve. It doesn't prevent crime. You know what we know prevents crime is better access to education, to employment, to to resources and healthcare, and an improved community. That reduces crime. And so the emphasis on maintaining this this workhouse and this facility. It, it just it's misguided, it's misplaced, and it shows poor leadership in terms of the administration. Yeah, I think MJ said it well, and it's it's critical for the individuals that are sitting in that decrepit, inhumane facility every day. It's critical for the broader point MJ said, and it's also critical, you know, from a budgetary <laughs> standpoint that we're told every day we don't have the funds to do the important community, to invest in the important community resources that will actually make people and families healthy and whole. And meanwhile, we're spending $16 million a year on this facility. So that's very much, to me, representative of this approach, this arrest and incarcerate approach that we've taken for a very long time in St. Louis. How big a frustration is it at this point that this campaign just can't seem to get the people in power to, to get on board? Well, it's certainly frustrating. I mean, I think it's frustrating for us. I know it's, um, I hear from people that have been in the workhouse who make up the membership of the campaign that it's frustrating for them to, that they're raising their voices and they see and hear that it's not being received. It's incredibly frustrating for them. I would say um, on a hopeful note that I do think we're making progress, that we have conversations you know, almost weekly at this point with, with folks who are in city government who are thinking differently about um, public safety policy, who are have some appetite for reallocating those funds to more community-based support. So I do think we're making progress, and I think we'll, we'll get there. I know one of your recent lawsuits was against a, a particularly bad landlord. Um, now that some of these local governments are on notice and they're trying to at least stay out of your crosshairs, do you think the next big front is going to be some of these bad private actors? Yeah, definitely. I think that that's that's that private actors have always been part of what we've been looking at and what we've litigated uh, in the past. And so we did with the civil work, civil litigation that we did. The civil work was a lot of landlord tenant work, um, and so we're pretty um, familiar with sort of the players in, in that that arena. And and when we see abuses, you know, we're we're going to pursue them. We're going to investigate. We're going to pursue. But in addition to the private actors such as landlords, we're also looking at private probation companies. We're looking at uh, other actors that play a role in the legal system that that disproportionately impact the poor and, and people of color. So looking ahead, um, let's look down the road to the next ten years. What do you think is the number one thing the region could do right now that would help your clients? And let's say the budget is not limitless. <laughs> let's talk in terms sure. of what are some practical things they could do. Blake, is there anything that comes to mind? Yeah, well, it sort of circles back to the conversation we started around the workhouse. I mean, what we've heard, first I should say, we, we believe pretty deeply in following the, the lead of impacted people. And so part of what we've done is asked people what they want to see for their communities. And so we've partnered with other organizations like Action St. Louis, Organization for Black Struggle, um, CAPCAR, many others, and, and have done town halls in communities and asked them what they want to see in their communities, how they would approach, if they were in charge of the, the budgets in their cities, what they would look like. And that's how we came up with this framework of re-envisioning public safety that we've pushed through the Close the Workhouse campaign that we at Arch City talk about in our work all the time. And that really is about, again, divesting from this harmful punishment complex, the carceral state, from police and prosecution and jails, and instead investing in mental health supports, in education, in jobs and job training, in community spaces, that those are the things that people told us they want to see in their own communities. And so all of our work really is driving at promoting that vision. It's all about really problematizing and attacking the systems that are continuing to criminalize people, that are continuing to harm them economically and socially and mentally, and instead really help them build in their own communities the, the kinds of systems that they need. So it really does continue to go back to those same issues that you started with. It's the same problem now as it was 10 years ago, to some extent. To some extent, yes. Um, you know, we have seen improvements, we have seen change, but what we're talking about is a, a sort of a, a, a paradigm shift in terms of how we want uh, this city to function and work and our region to function and work. And, um, you know, the, the, at the very beginning, the first thing we ever, you know, our first clients is we took on 
We just listened to them and believed them and, and took what they were telling us uh, seriously and, and, and valued their perspectives and, and their, their uh, lived experiences. And that's basically what we've been doing for 10 years. We've been trying to do that every single day and, and use the tools that we have as lawyers to impact their lives in positive ways. Um, and, and frankly, you know, we had some great successes, but for every 10 applicants, you know, we just take one. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, we're just 15 lawyers and 14 uh, paralegals and support staff and, and other, other amazing people that we work with, but it's not, we're not big enough to, to handle all of the, the cases that come through our door. Um, and so that's, that's one of the, the things that still is, is challenging, is knowing that there's still so many people out there that, that we haven't touched. Is that part of the goal for the next 10 years, that you'd like to scale up to a point where you could get twice as many clients? Or is that just asking for trouble, get too big? And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's always a balance. We, we certainly, as you said, we've grown quite a lot in a fairly short period of time. We still are, I think, in the midst of that growth um, and have some, some critical pieces like social work, um, capacity we're looking to, to add to our organization. Um, and we do want to be able to serve more people. But as I said, we know that we will never, with the current status quo, we will never be able to meet all of the need. And so we have to talk about and push for systemic, structural, institutional change. That's the only way that we actually get to a point where people don't need an Arch City Defenders. You know, this is a, a created dynamic. We've, we have created the conditions where there are thousands of people that need a place like Arch City. That's a choice, and we can make a different choice. So we've got one last question. It's actually coming from a listener uh, via Twitter, and I have a feeling this might be a question you'd welcome, which is, <laughs> will you give info on how to donate to Arch City Defenders? If people want to do one of those monthly donations like you were talking about, where can they sign up to Absolutely. do that? Absolutely. Thank you for the question. Uh, <laughs> you can find out all of the information you need if you go to archcitydefenders.org. Um, and there's a, a donate button at the bottom of the landing page. You can also find out more about the organization there. Um, and for those who are interested, we actually, so we are, we're at our 10 year anniversary. We have a celebration tomorrow night, Friday night, and then a racial justice roundtable at the Deaconess Center for Child Wellbeing on Saturday. That Saturday event is totally free. We have, I checked right before we came on the air, we have 20 tickets exactly left for sale. Um, Friday the, sold out, but Saturday has no, 20 no, tickets. Put, oh, Friday. We put 25 more up 25 yesterday. 25 more. Okay. Yes, we and Danny Glover space. is going to be there. Danny Glover is going to be there. Special guest. We're doing a live recording of our podcast, Under the Arch, with Kayla Reed from Action St. Louis. It'll be a really great time. You can learn more about Arch City. Party with us. Um, and hang out with, with Danny Glover. And yeah. hang out with Danny Glover. So there's that's 20 tickets left. That's a pretty exciting offer right there. Buy those. And that's at acdturns10.org. acdturns10.org. Well, that, uh, you got that right there. So that's Blake. Blake Strode, the executive director of Arch City Defenders. Blake, thank you for joining us thank today. You. And we're also joined by the firm's co-founder, Michael John Voss. Michael John, thank you for joining us. Thank you. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio, 90.7 KWMU. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association. Missouri produces wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details on the variety of products made in the state are at ChooseWood.com.